Good evening, and welcome to the College of Arts and Sciences online information session for math and the natural sciences. Joining us tonight are Professors Butler, Chotner, and Toktrop, and they will be discussing majors and minors in mathematics, statistics, astronomy, chemistry, geology, environmental geology, and physics. I'm Lynn Marie Hamill from the Office of Undergraduate Studies, and I'll be taking your questions via email to be answered live on air. If you have a question, please send it to summerregehelp at case.edu with the subject, info, subject line info session. If we do not answer your question on air, we will be back in touch with you soon. And now to your hosts, Professor Butler, Chotner, and Tatrup. Good evening. I'm Chris Butler. I'm from the Mathematics Department. And I was going to spend a few minutes first talking about the department and the different degrees that we have. So we actually have um, five different degrees that we offer. The first one is a Bachelor of Arts with a major in Mathematics. It's sort of our most versatile degree. It allows for the most different options, most second majors, triple majors, things like that. It's really good for a student that might want to go into medicine or law or something else like that. Then we have a Bachelor of Arts degree with teacher certification. So if you're interested in becoming a certified teacher for high school, that would be the right degree for you. Then we have a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics. It's your standard science degree um, for a student that's really interested in, in doing mathematics. We have a Bachelor of Science in Applied Mathematics. So if you have an interest in working on applied areas, this would be a really good degree for you. And finally, we have a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics and Physics, and it's a joint degree between the Mathematics Department and the Physics Department. Now, with all these different degrees, you might say, well, how in the world am I going to set up my first semester schedule? You know, do I have to choose? Do I not choose? What should I do? Well, the nice thing is that we have several ways to, to go about doing this. The first thing is the, the first year registration guide. Look through that. That will help provide a great deal of information on setting up your first semester schedule. You should, when you're doing it, you should be thinking about using 14 to 17 hours, four to five classes. Now, next thing, general education requirements. There are a couple things you want to keep in mind. You're going to have to take SAGE's class. Arts and Humanities, Natural and Mathematical Sciences, Social Sciences, Quantitative Reasoning, Global and Cultural Diversity, and Physical Education. Now, if you're going to have a Bachelor in Arts and Mathematics, this is basically your first semester schedule. You have a SAGE's first seminar, Math 121, an Arts and Humanities course, maybe Engineering 131, maybe a culture and diversity class, and phys ed. If you have a Bachelor of Science in math or applied mathematics, again, a SAGES class, Math 121, probably a chemistry class, astronomy, geology, again, Engineering 131, maybe cultural, global and cultural diversity, and phys ed. If you look at those two, there's not much difference between them. If you're going a BA or a BS, your first semester schedule is not going to change. So you don't need to really be too concerned with what degree you're going for right for the first semester. And again, if you were thinking about a bachelor's in math and physics, again, SAGES, probably want to take physics 121 your first semester, math 121, a chemistry class, some more physics and phys ed. Now, a lot of students have asked about different calculus sequences. We actually have three in the math department. We have the math 125, 126 sequence, the math 121, 122, 223, 224 sequence, and our math 124, 227, 228 honors sequence. Now, how do you choose between the, well, the first thing you should look at is what is your major. Does your major require Math 121? If it does, that's the sequence for you. If not, if you're in a, a, a major that doesn't require it, you should think about taking Math 125, 126. 
Now, if you have several options, you have one major that requires 121, one major that requires 125, I would suggest that you take Math 121. The reason being that for all majors that require 125, Math 121 works also. And lastly, the honor sequence, that is by invitation. You'll be getting a letter from Dean Mason inviting you into that sequence. If he invites you, you want to consider doing that, especially if you're going to be a math major or a physics major. It covers the same material that's in our 121, 122, 223, 224 sequence, but at a little greater depth and a little greater you know, theoretical level. Now, what about advanced placement? Well, if you have a four or five on the AB exam, that will get you out of Math 121 or Math 125. If you have a four or five on the BC exam, that will get you out of Math 125, 126, or Math 121, 122. So it gets you out of two semesters and actually earns you eight credits. Now, some students say, I'm not sure. I got the grade. I don't know. Should I take my AP credit or should I repeat the course? My recommendation to you is try. Try the course that you would be normally placed in by your AP credit. You have the first two weeks of class to find out whether or not you're going to be OK. If you are, great. If it seems like it's going to be too much, you're always welcome to move back and not use your AP credit and start. Um, we have found that students that have gotten a five on the exam normally have no trouble. Students that get fours usually have a little bit more trouble. So if you have a four, you could consider repeating the course. But again, my recommendation first is might as well try it and see what happens. Now, what opportunities do we have for undergraduates? Well, there are quite a few. Certainly, we have undergraduates that do research for us. Um, I myself hire what we call SI leaders. So not for your first year, but in your second and so forth. We have students that um, help run tutoring sessions and um, help students that struggle in our first semester courses. Um, there's, of course, study abroad, co-op, we have a math club and Pi Mu Epsilon. Pi Mu Epsilon is the National Math Honor Society. That's something that you can get uh, involved in. And we're also quite active in math competitions. Um, we've actually won the last seven years in a row. So um, we do pretty well at those. Now, we do offer quite a few more classes than just calculus. Um, as you can see from this list, we have classes in knot theory, scientific computing, cryptology, math biology, information theory. There's a whole world of math after calculus. So don't think that, that once you've gotten through calculus, you've covered all of math. There's quite a bit of things that you can, can take after that. Um, lastly, if you have more or want more information, the best place to look is at the Mathematics Department website, which is listed there. Or I can be reached. Um, I probably have the easiest email address of anybody at the university. It's chris at case.edu. Or, of course, you can use my toll-free number, 1-800-659-MATH. And I'm, I'm happy to, to answer any questions that, that you might have about, about the math department or majoring in math or just um, which math class you might want to take. Now, I'll turn it over to Greg and he'll talk about chemistry. Yep. So, um, there are a few changes in the chemistry department this year. Um, so, what I want to do firstly is go through the degree options that are possible in chemistry. So, what you're going to find in chemistry is that we offer both a Bachelor of Arts major and a Bachelor of Science major. And that, that's going to be pretty common to most of the sciences. And so one thing that I would like to talk for just a minute about is what's the difference between a Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Science. 
And I think the best answer to that is it's, it's highly field specific. So some fields will say that the two degrees are relatively equivalent, but in other fields um, you, there are specific distinctions. And that becomes important specifically for which courses you're going to register for for your first year. And the specific course that's important to be aware of is your calculus course. So the Bachelor of Arts um, degree in chemistry, um, we like to see it, we like to, to view it as a very flexible degree that allows individuals to do a degree in chemistry and also do other things. So one of the things that, that we advocate our undergraduates that are Bachelor of Arts majors is that a lot of times they, they will look into double majoring and majoring in other things. Um, we've had several students that have Bachelor of Arts in Chemistry and then also um, Bachelor's Degrees in Music. Um, we also say that this is a pretty flexible degree in terms of if you are interested in a pre-medical or pre-dental or, or um, any pre-health health career. Um, you contrast that to the Bachelor of Science degree. So the Bachelor of Science degree is a pretty technical degree. There's a lot more mathematics associated with it. It'll go up through differential equations. There's a lot more physics involved with it. It goes up through um, modern physics. And there are a lot more chemistry courses associated with it. And it, it is an important distinction if you think that graduate school, either a master's or a PhD, and chemistry might be in, in your future, or if you're interested in working in the chemical industry. And it's hard to know these things, but if you have fundamental interest in chemistry and think you think that that may be your um, career path, it's, it's important to know the distinctions between the two. And so for the Bachelor of Arts, um, the major distinction in your first year is that you would take math 125 in your first semester and then um, oh sorry you would take math 125 in your first semester if you wanted a bachelor of science degree you would go to um, math 121 in your first semester. The rest of it is pretty much the same so so for all chemistry degrees you will have your, in your first year, you will have a general chemistry course, and that consists of chemistry 105, 106, and then the lab that's associated with that, which is chem 113. So you're gonna see that in both the Bachelor of Arts degree, that it, it has the same general chemistry requirement, and then you'll also see it in the Bachelor of Science degree. Um, what is new in the department this year in terms of majors is that we have a new major called chemical biology. And so it, it's probably an important distinction and it, it probably is worthwhile for me to explain what chemical biology is because it's probably a term that most students coming in have, are not familiar with. And so if you think about the two fields of chemistry and biology, they, they really sort of make up a spectrum of all sorts of things that you see in modern science. And I think probably the best example of the chemistry biology spectrum is the drug discovery industry. That's probably the best example of synergy between the biological sciences and the chemical sciences. And so with that synergy, there, there ends up being a lot of overlap between the two. And then we also have a degree on campus called biochemistry that you would sort of imagine would encompass, would be right in the middle of that chemistry biology spectrum. But, and that, and that is true when, when that field started, but over the years what's happened is that the biochemistry field has really drifted much more towards the biological side of the spectrum. And, and the field in general has identified that, that um, there really needs to be an emphasis on training in the more chemical oriented side of this chemistry biology spectrum. So we have a new degree um, that tries to capture that. And so the emphasis in this degree is um, fundamental courses in chemistry, but then also an emphasis in getting your fundamental co courses in biology and new courses in chemical biology. And, and another, another advantage of our chemical biology degree is that it really is, a, we designed it as a highly flexible major that was specifically designed for people that are interested in um, pre-medical studies. Um, so again, with, with the 
Bachelor of Arts in Chemical Biology. Your first year is also going to be um, the the decision there is really your math course. So um, math 125 is indicated for the Bachelor of Arts in Chemical Biology. Um, so really, so so just sort of recap, the if, if you're considering working in the chemical industry and considering a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry degree, the major thing you need to think about is taking Math 121. Um, the next major topic that I need to talk about with respect to chemistry is um, credit for the AP exam. So, so what is also new this year is that in years past, if you got a four or a five on your chemistry AP exam, you were given credit for Chemistry 105, Chemistry 106, and the laboratory Chemistry 113. So what we found is that students that took advantage of their AP credit for 105 and 106 were not performing very well when they would get into the next level of chemistry, which was organic chemistry. And statistically speaking, those students that are taking Chem 105 and Chem 106, most of them will go on to take um, organic chemistry. And so what we decided to do was to, to make sure that students had the best preparation going into organic chemistry, but at the same time we wanted to make sure that students could proceed at a rapid rate if that's what they wanted to do. So we did a couple things in the department. So historically what we had done is only offered organic chemistry in the fall and the spring, but now we offer organic chemistry that you can start in either the fall or the spring. So starting this year, if you have AP credit, either a four or five on the AP exam, you will get credit for Chem 105, Chem 113, and then you will take Chem 106 your first semester on campus, and then you'll take your first semester of organic chemistry, Chem 223, in the spring semester of your first year. So you're actually ahead of the game in that sense. Um, the other aspect that is related to this is that if you're going on to take organic chemistry for any of the various majors, there's two flavors of organic chemistry, which is 223 and then 323. And so um, 323 is only taught in a fall, spring course sequence. And, and so the advice that I usually give people for 323 is that's, that's we call it the honors level of organic chemistry. Um, and it's also indicated for the um, chemical biology major. It is really designed for those that are interested in organic chemistry as it's applied to life sciences. So it's, it's commonly suggested for individuals that are interested in a pre-medical career or if they're interested in the chemical biology major. Um, another common question for chemistry is the Chem 113 lab if you do not have AP credit for Chem 113. And the question is, should I take Chem 113 in the fall semester, or should I wait and take it in the spring semester? And I think that the, the best advice for that is that a lot, of pe a lot of times students will not want to take Chem 113 in the fall because they'll already have a biology course and they'll have the laboratory associated with that. Um, we traditionally encourage students to take 113 in the fall. Um, there's multiple reasons for that. If, um, if you are a sciences major at Case, you will have situations where you have two laboratory classes per semester. Um, in addition to that, um, there are some logistic issues that if everybody waits to take Chem 113 in the spring, then there's not enough slots, and then you get bumped to the, to the next year. So um, we strongly encourage people that if, if they're interested in getting if they're interested in taking 113 in the fall, to go ahead and do it. Um, I think that's sort of the major issues for chemistry. So, Professor John there. Okay. Uh, hello. I actually have only one slide in this PowerPoint file today uh, because that one slide directs you to our department's website, which has the answers to a lot of the questions that you might have, including uh, uh, descriptions of our degree programs typical first semester schedules for our various degree programs, uh, answers to questions about the various introductory physics sequences, both for majors and for non-majors, uh, answers to questions about AP credit, transfer credit, proficiency exams, and descriptions of how to get involved in undergraduate research, co-op, study abroad, et cetera. 
So I wanted to take you on a short guided tour of this website. And you can access this, uh, this on your own to learn more. Uh, if you want to navigate to here, uh, you can either remember or look on this uh, uh, webinar to get the website, or just find the physics department, which is the same place chemistry and math are. Go to academic programs and undergraduate. And this is a web page that I maintain. The link at the top describes our various degree programs. Now, there are uh, several here, and I don't want to take your time today to run through all of them, uh, because the good news is that the courses you need to take your first year, not just your first semester, but your first year, are almost identical for all of them, with one exception that I'll point out in a moment. So if, for example, you click on the Bachelor of Science degree, you'll get a description of what it's about, why it's for. Now, I realize you can't read the small print today, uh, most likely on the screen you're looking at, but you can look at this, this up on your own later. A list of all the courses you'll need to take eventually. But what's probably most important to you now is the typical schedule. And what you'll see here for the BS degree in physics is, yes, you need to take physics your first semester, math and chemistry. Uh, and you have to take a first seminar, Sages. And then you probably have, well, you have an open elective, and we suggest you take Physics 166, which is a one-credit course, uh, pass, no pass. And if you show up, you pass, quite literally. Uh, it's designed to give you a flavor of what it means to do physics, to be a physicist, to be a physics major. Several departments on campus have courses like this. Astronomy has an almost identical course that they run in the spring of the uh, first year. So that's a course you should sign up for if you have any interest at all in physics. It's not at all like intro physics. Uh, physicists don't, as professionals, slide blocks down inclined planes, etc. the sorts of things you see in intro physics. It's a much more interesting course showing you the, the very state-of-the-art things that we're working on in our department and physicists are working on in general. We're bringing people from outside the department. In any case, if you were to look at any of our other degree programs, you would see basically the same options for the first year. Uh, take physics, take math, and Professor Butler has told you your options for math. Uh, take one of the two chemistry options. And this is where things get just a little bit tricky. Uh, 105 or 111 is fine for all of our majors, all varieties of physics majors with one exception, and that's for the engineering physics degree. The Case School of Engineering requires that students in that major take Chem 111 followed by Engineering 145. And so if you're interested in both engineering and physics, uh, then you should register for that Chem 111 course instead of Chem 105. If you're at all tempted by engineering, you should register for Chem 111 instead. Because for all of our other degree programs, we'll accept either. Now at the top of this page, uh, you'll see advice for majors and potential majors in physics. So if you're potentially interested in majoring physics, you should click on this link, find it and click on it, and you'll see two pages of advice uh, about the various courses you might take, how to choose between the various options, et cetera. Again, I'm going through this pretty quickly uh, now, but you can uh, review it at your own pace later. Okay? Uh, it includes uh, questions or issues about, for example, our enhanced version. We don't call it honors, but our enhanced version of physics, which you may be invited to. Those invitations will go out shortly. It also advises you not to worry if you aren't invited uh, into that course. Either our physics 121 or our 123 enhanced sequence are fine. About half of our majors go through each. Uh, the enhanced version is for students who really have a love of physics. You don't have to be a major. In fact, I think 80% of the students in it are not majors, don't end up being physics majors. Uh, but it's designed to appeal and to challenge students. If your impression of physics is it's something you have to take, don't sign up for Physics 123. If you think this is going to look better on your transcript or on your resume, don't take it because no one outside case will know the difference. Okay? You take it if you are interested and have a love for physics and want to learn to think like a physicist. Okay? So the rest of this document gives a lot more information about the various options. The first two pages are intended to first year, uh, uh, for first year students. Then if you want to read on, there's advice for students who declare majors, including some specific advice for the variety of majors, like a BA. Uh, in physics, I'd say there's not much to choose between a BA and a BS. The BA is the more flexible degree. It's fine for becoming a professional physicist. If you were to go to a Harvard or Princeton or Yale, you'd have a BA. And many of our faculty have BA degrees. So we don't think of it as lesser in any sense. It's just designed to give you more flexibility. It's a little bit easier to combine majors if you pursue a BA. This is, I think, true across the board. One of the nice things about CASE is how easy it is to pursue multiple majors. And a BA, which has fewer requirements down the road, makes that easier for you to do. 
And if you decide to be a professional physicist at some point, you'll probably use those open electives to take more physics courses. But it's fine if you decide to uh, do physics and music. If you want to do physics and math, we have a custom program for that, but physics and chemistry, all, physics and dance, physics and theater, we have a variety of combinations of degrees you'll see. But in any case, the rest of this document uh, will give you uh, some information about other options like engineering physics, some things that you don't really have to worry about your first semester. So that's why I don't want to focus on this too much right now. Okay. The, if we backtrack now to the main undergraduate page, uh, the next link would be course descriptions. I don't think I need to click on that. What may be of more interest to you is the link that tells you about introductory physics. If you're concerned about which sequence of physics should you take, uh, this uh, web page will describe the various sequences. But it's actually pretty easy uh, in general. If you are intending to pursue a BA in the life sciences, then most likely you'll be taking physics 115, 116, and not in your freshman year. That would be unusual. Uh, if you are pursuing engineering or physics or many other majors, you'll be taking physics 121 and 122, unless you're in, perhaps if you're invited to physics 123 and 124, then you may do those instead. Uh, in any case, uh, this page also includes information about uh, the AP credit. If you have AP credit for Physics B, be aware that's an algebra-based uh, AP course, and that will not get you credit for Physics 121. So if you intend to pursue a major in engineering or physics, etc., you'll need to get that Physics 121 credit somehow. One way of doing it in all these subjects, I think, in introductory courses is proficiency exams. So if you think you should get credit for one of our courses, but you didn't earn it via getting a four or five on AP credit, then you can, shortly before classes start, the schedule will be made available to you, you can take a physics proficiency exam or a math proficiency exam available in a wide range of topics. The FY guide will also give you more information. On this website, uh, we even have sample exams. If you want to test your understanding, you can call up a sample exam that was given one year for Physics 121 or, or other courses. Uh, so for example, if you have AP credit uh, for Physics 121 and want to skip Physics 122 it also, you can come in, uh, I think it's the Thursday before classes start, and you can uh, take this exam and see if you earn credit. You don't earn a grade, you earn credit when you pass a proficiency exam. I should also warn you that only about 20 to 30 percent of the students who attempt the proficiency exam pass it in Physics, but you're welcome to try. Also, this page includes uh, information about transfer credit, which I won't try to show you now. That's mainly uh, for students who want to take courses in the summer or, or abroad, et cetera. But some, high, some uh, incoming freshmen also earn transfer credit. Moving down on our web page, I'm not going to show you everything here. Um, there's a list of physics majors and what they've done with our degrees, if you're interested. If you are interested in getting involved in undergraduate research, I'd actually advise you to be patient don't try to cram too much into your freshman year, but every year we do have one or two students who, as freshmen, uh, manage to get positions in our research group. There are systems to get involved uh, in research along the way, and in fact, all physics majors are required to do research. It's their SAGE's capstone project, and all majors on campus have SAGE's capstone projects, so it's very easy to get involved in research on this campus. And this webpage shows you the various mechanisms if you scan on down, you'll even see a list of senior projects. This is from the most recent graduating class. And this will give you an idea or a sense of the sorts of things you can do on this campus. And if you were to skim down this, you would see that many of these are done in conjunction with faculty in other departments. That's also quite common. Backing up again, uh, undergraduate newsletter, all sorts of news of interest. If you have concerns about what sorts of jobs do physicists get, there are postings there about jobs. I won't click on that. Uh, study abroad opportunities, etc. So I think that's uh, about all I have to say to you now, but we'd be glad to take questions. All right. Great information from all three of you, you guys. We do have a few questions that are in already, but I want to remind people, if you do have questions, please send them to summerregehelp at case.edu. But the first question is from Dana, and I guess this goes to Professor Toktrop. The question is, I signed up for Chem 105 and 113 as suggested by the first year registration guide. When I sign up for Chem 113, it signs me up for a Principles of Chemistry lab lecture. Is this what is supposed to happen and what is it for? 
So the answer to your question is yes, that's what's supposed to happen. So every laboratory course in chemistry will have two parts. There will be the laboratory section where you're actually going to do the experimental work. And then there will be a lecture section where you discuss the principles behind what you're going to be doing and basically get you ready for the theory and the safety associated with the experiment that you're going to be doing. But the answer to your question is absolutely yes, that's appropriate. Okay, we have another question. This could actually be answered by any of the three. It's regarding Engineering 131 because for the BS degrees in some of your programs. We have a student who's taken the AP exam and has gotten credit for ESIS 132. Would they be able to use that instead of Engineering 131 in your respective departments? Um, for the mathematics department, the answer is yes. If you have credit for the ESIS 132, then we would allow that to cover the Engineering 131. And the answer is also yes for physics. Yeah, I'm not even, I don't even think that it's required for, and it's not required for either of the BAs in chemistry, and I'm, I don't think it's required for the BS in chemistry, so. Great. Uh, now I have another AP credit, and it's for chemistry. And Zach said he was wondering about the chemistry AP credit. He saw in the registration guide there was a chemistry placement test or proficiency to get out of the second semester chemistry. What kind of preparation would be necessary for this exam? I did well in AP chemistry and, if possible, would not want to, to repeat it. So, if, so you will see in that email that you are going to email me to sign up for the proficiency exam. When you email me, um, we use proficiency exams that are generated by the American Chemical Society. And so the American Chemical Society also maintains a website for preparation materials and they also maintain previous exams. So when you send that to me, I will start sending reply emails confirming that you've registered for the proficiency exam. And when I send that reply email that you've registered for it, that included in that reply email will be all the information to study for it. Great. Now we're, we'll, we'll kind of stay on the theme of, of AP credit that we have right now. So Kenny emailed in and he said that he has AP credit for Math 121 and 122 already because of his AP exam. What courses would you guys recommend to take instead of math in the respective majors? Well, I mean, if he was going to be majoring in math, certainly he should go on and either take Math 223 or if he was invited, he should take Math 227, sort of just keep moving along. Also, there's some other courses. We offer a Math 307, which is our abstract algebra, and there's a precursor to that, Math 305, which is the keys to abstract mathematics. And depending on his level of math sophistication, he, should, he could think about taking either Math 305 or 307. So certainly, if he's a math major, he should keep on moving in the calculus sequence. And he might want to consider taking some classes that are sort of outside the calculus sequence. So let me speak for all other majors, or most of many other majors at least, and say uh, we would give you the same advice. If you're going to be a physics major, an astronomy major, et cetera, and it's going to require all, or an engineering student, it's going to require all four semesters of math, go ahead and start on the third semester of math is, is good advice. Uh, your other options are to just explore. So if you're considering multiple majors, et cetera, mm -hmm. you could use that freedom you've gained by earning AP credit to uh, try other things. But students sometimes are, are wary about getting rusty if they skip a semester of a subject like math or physics. And so often you just go ahead and continue it because then you'll enjoy freedom later on uh, after you're done with the math requirements for other majors and, and can explore then. So I would agree with everything that was said. And the one thing that I would add to it is that in both the natural and physical sciences. I think that one thing that is starting to become recognized as important is statistics classes. And in addition to being recognized as advantageous in the sciences, it's not required for any, any for our majors, but it is beginning to become a requirement to select medical schools. So if you're interested in a degree in the sciences and you're thinking about medical school and you don't want to jump into calculus three yet um, it is not a uniform requirement but some medical schools are starting to require statistics courses so that's another option great it sounds like there are lots of options out there 
Now I have a question. This is probably for Professor Butler. Evangeline is an incoming first year and is interested in Math 201, which is linear algebra, and wants to know if that is a appropriate course for a first year student, and if it's closed, does she have any chance of getting into the class as a first year student? Uh, depending on your major, it wouldn't be a bad class to think about, um, though I would may, might want to think about putting it off until later on in, in, in your, your course of study. Um, the other thing is that 201 is sort of the engineering linear algebra, and the, the 307 that I talked about earlier was sort of the, the linear algebra for math majors. So if she was a math major, I wouldn't re recommend her taking the 201 because it's, it's not useful for the math major. Um, and if, she, they're, they're, if the class is full, I wouldn't expect that there's going to be mon many openings for, for first year students. Okay, thank you. And this one I'm hoping for Professor Chotner may be able to help with. Heather wants to know if majoring in astronomy would be the, in the first year, the first, small, the first fall semester schedule would be similar to the physics one. Actually, the first year is identical to the physics uh, major, except that uh, astronomy doesn't require chemistry. And uh, instead of Physics 166, they have their own course. I think it's Astronomy 151 as a general introduction to what astronomers actually do. That, and you can take that in the spring, I believe. But otherwise, uh, astronomy majors take so much physics during the course of their career here. We consider them physics majors. We just don't tell the astronomy department. That's a good. That's a good plan, I guess. As, as long as you're a physics department person. Well, actually, I should add something to that. Astronomy majors get a free physics minor along the way. So all you have to do is fill out a piece of paper because you've taken so much physics. That sounds like a bonus. Okay, so now we have someone else who's interested in a physics major and wants to know a little bit more about what type of um, careers are there for physics majors if they're not going on into teaching. Actually. Uh, a small percentage of uh, physicists, I think, actually go into teaching, less than a third, I'd expect. And I'd say the breadth of careers available to physics majors would probably surprise you. If you go to our undergraduate newsletter, you'll find uh, pages, basically, of descriptions of career opportunities. But I think the same thing applies definitely to math. Uh, you'll find physicists and mathematicians, I think, in banks, insurance companies, and in government, and policy making uh, operations. Uh, I, the list just goes on and on. Um, so, again, if you were to go back to our website, you could see what our majors have actually done. If you go to that physics majors page, you can see what they've done with their degrees. You can easily go on to engineering graduate school and just a variety of things. Great. Thank you. This one is Professor Toktra. We have a student who's undecided between chemistry and chemical engineering and wants to know if you can talk a little bit about the differences and how easy it would be to change from one to the other if they decide in their first year which one they want to do. Sure. Um, so, you know, I think that one of the things is, is an important to make the distinction of what is the difference between chemistry and chemical engineering. And, and when people ask me that, I, I, I usually explain it like this. I usually say that if you have a problem, let's say that you want to make a new material, the person that is involved with the chemistry in that is going to be interested in figuring out if the reactions are possible, figuring out if it's possible to even make these new materials, and then chemical engineers are going to be the ones that deal with how do we make tons of this material. But in terms of like the logistics of just what courses would you take in your first year, the important distinction is going to be between your math courses and your general chemistry courses. And I didn't address this when I talked before, and I should address this. With the math courses, you would want to take um, Math 121 to um, prepare yourself for potentially going down the engineering track. And then you would want to take Chemistry 111. So Chemistry 111 is Introductory Chemistry for Engineers, and that dovetails into Engineering 145, which is, general chem which is the chemistry of materials. And that's an important distinction for anybody that is considering the natural sciences compared, uh, natural and physical sciences as compared to an engineering major. So if you're, if you're thinking about one or the other, if you're thinking about math or physics or an engineering major, I would encourage you to go down the engineering track because those, those majors are going to be much more regimented. And if you don't take chemistry 111 followed by chemistry 145, you'll, you'll start to find yourself a little bit behind early on. Um, 
And then the question is, can you, if you decide to go chemistry 111 to 145, can you then transfer back into a natural sciences major? And the answer is absolutely yes. And if you start in 105, 106, can you go into an engineering track? The answer is also yes, but it is slightly more difficult. Thank you. So we have a few questions um, from Brittany uh, about undergraduate research and they want to know how easy it is to get into research and is it, and do faculty members in your departments take first year students in research labs? Well, there's not too much for first year students to do in math research. You just need to build up uh, what we'll call a lot of machinery before you can be that helpful in, in doing any math research. Now we have some faculty that hire people to do some programming and that sort of thing, but usually they're, they're juniors or seniors before they, they have the, the sophistication necessary. You know, a little bit more in the, we have quite a few faculty members that work in the area of math biology, and there are a few more opportunities in, in that area. Good. Oh, I would say in chemistry, it's probably, I mean, you're, I think you're gonna find this uniformly a, across the university is that the freshman year is is sort of a transitional period in a lot of different ways and it's it's academically transitionally it's so it's it, academically it's a transition socially it's a transition and so getting into a research lab is also a transition and so I think that most people recognize that doing research that first year is, is usually a pretty difficult thing that being said I've had two freshmen that have gone through my lab and done the um, research in my lab and they've gone on to very successful careers. They're both in PhD programs at various places in the country. And so it is, if, if you are highly interested, highly motivated, and you are willing to go knock on people's doors, then I would say it's a possibility. Um, but it is not a, it's not a statistical likelihood that if you do research, you'll do it in your first year. And in the physics department, uh, I, I think I said earlier that typically one or two freshmen each year will talk their way into a research group. Uh, you, you heard already uh, that the trick is to knock on doors, to be persistent, uh, and uh, that's the way that most of these positions are filled. Uh, by the time students get to their sophomore year, have a, more of a track record, know more faculty, know what they want to do, have made it through the freshman courses, then that number grows to perhaps a quarter to a third. And then all seniors in uh, physics must do research. So you know, you're guaranteed to that experience by that time. Great. Um, so we have a student, uh, Connor, who's interested in um, going to graduate school in chemistry and wants to know if there's anything specific that he needs to focus on um, coming in. He's heard a lot about pre-med uh, chemistry and there's a lot of information out there. Is there anything that he needs to do or to keep aware of to go on to a, a graduate program in chemistry? No, I, I think that what, what my advice would be is that if, if you think that your career is going to take you down that track, um, then you are probably going to find a highly receptive audience to, in, to all, a highly receptive audience in all the faculty in whatever department you're in because that's the, that's the track that we went down. So my one piece of advice is to make sure that you make contact with the professors in your department and tell them that you're interested in potentially pursuing this as your career and they are going to be very receptive and they're going to want to spend time with you. That's one of the advantages of CASE is that it's a major research institution but the incoming class sizes are small enough such that you can have this intimate interaction with the faculty. I think that goes regardless of what your, your end career goals are that one of the things that you should work on as a first year student is to getting to know the faculty of your courses and also other faculty and departments that you're interested in because they can make you aware of opportunities that exist there for you. You know, maybe they have summer internships that they get information about or other research positions or what we call REUs, research experience for undergraduates for summer. So if I had any advice for, for incoming first year students is get to know the faculty, certainly of the classes that you're teaching or taking, but also of faculty in the department that you're interested in majoring. So they can provide you a lot of resources. 
Yeah, sort of. I mean, t taking two two questions together, you know, the one about freshmen doing research, and, and this question about, you know, what should what should I do if I think that this is my career path? I, I think that you know a good example that I can point to is that a student that was in introductory chemistry went to her professor of that course and said, I think I'm really interested in this, and that individual directed the student to me and she just came to talk to me and she, and she ended up working in my lab she worked in my lab for four years and she's in you know pretty much the best chemistry program PhD program in the country right now so that's great so we, um, Janice wants to know about study abroad and if it's possible to do it in your individual majors and if so when's the best time to do it and if she can she take physics classes abroad or they have to be some general ones? Can they use courses from abroad for their major? Well, since you mentioned physics, I'll take the lead on this. Again, if you go back to our website, you'll see a page devoted to study abroad. It's absolutely possible to take physics courses abroad or to take other courses abroad. I'm the person in our department who actually approves those when a student comes to me. The tricky part usually is does the institution uh, that you're going to be attending offer the right course the right semester? So for example, we had a student who went to Australia and had to choose between two universities and one offered quantum mechanics in the fall and the other offered quantum mechanics in the spring and that made the decision for her because she was only spending a semester abroad. Uh, but it's something that's growing on this campus that the institution in general is trying to make easier for students. So uh, uh, you can study abroad in I think any major, isn't that right? Uh, cer certainly in mathematics you can study abroad that, that most you know, universities have sort of the same set of standard classes for math majors. Um, some of our courses are year-long sequences and then it gets a little tricky if you're only going for one semester. You make sure you, you know, as, as Professor Chotner said, that you took the right class the right semester. But with a lot, with, you know, with some planning, it's, it's more than possible to do study abroad. Yeah, and, and so I think that, um, I, I, the only thing that I would say is that I think that it's not dissimilar as compared to getting transfer credit from another university. Let's say that you're gonna take a course during the summer at another university. The process is, is that you contact the representative in, in your department, so when you have the representatives in the three departments listed here in math, physics, and chemistry, that if you're interested in doing study abroad, you would just identify the courses that you wanna take at these various universities. And there is a pretty simple process by which we just look at the syllabus from the courses that you're interested in taking and say, is that equivalent to the course here at Case? So it, it's, it's, it, it's relatively straightforward. Thank you. So now I have uh, Karen who has a question. She has AP credit for psych, econ, and history and wants to know how this is going to help her meet her degree requirements. She's not sure where in the sciences she's going, so I guess this could be for any of you guys. Well, if, if you look back at the, one of the first slides I showed, it talked about your sort of general education requirements and you had some, some breadth requirements. So. You had your SAGES course, but then you had to take courses in the arts and humanities, the social sciences, quantitative reasoning. And by having the AP credit for those, that sort of knocks off some of those courses, so it allows you to take other things in their place. So you have a lot more freedom. You can have freedom to just experiment with things, or if you have already ideas about what you want to do, you can double major, you can take more math courses, maybe more physics or chemistry courses, but, but it, it gives you the freedom to do quite a bit of, of exploration or maybe more in-depth study in, in something that you're interested in. So it, it, it opens up a world of possibilities for you. Great, now I have a question from Matt and this is for Professor Butler. I'm planning on majoring in mathematics and I'm interested in both research and study abroad, but I'm worried that doing both might restrict the amount of classes I take. Does a typical research program take up any class time limiting credit hours? Um, well, just like with physics, all of our students have to do a senior capstone. So you can do your senior capstone research project in mathematics. So that it's not going to limit the, the number of credit hours. Um, and, and we have quite a few students that do study abroad. So, so there's, there's no problem with, with doing both of those things. And we actually encourage it. I think the, other, the only other thing to chime in on that is that 
research in general is pretty open-ended in terms of the scheduling. It's, it, there, there are not regimented times for research. You find a laboratory on campus that is doing things that you're interested in, you know, knock on their door, convince them that you would be a great person to work there. And what happens is that you just figure out a schedule from there that works around your course schedule. Um, so that, I think that's an important thing because I think that this is something that's probably foreign to most students coming in is that um, what does it mean to be it's part of research? Kind of um, it, it's, it's, there's, it's not a regimented course. It's, it's a very free, open form thing. Um, and so you sort of schedule it around your courses. And I'd like to add something about how this is handled in the physics department. Uh, there are actually a couple of ways of getting involved in research. Most of our students uh, take paid jobs in the research labs, and so they're paid on the order of $10 an hour and work on the average of 10, uh, 10 hours a week, uh, and so it's a paid position. Uh, you can also sign up for a course credit. You won't get paid in that case. You'll be paying us in a sense. Uh, but again, the normal load would be about 10 hours a week if you're going to get involved in research. You have to spend about that much time to really be doing something productive. Uh, but there's no problem spending, uh, for most students, spending 10 hours a week on a job or research, but also spending the time you need on your courses. Thank you. Now I have a question regarding the difference between a BA and a BS as it relates to medical school, dental school, vet school, or other pre-health. Do the med schools prefer a BS degree? And I guess it's more directed toward Professor Tocktrop. I think that the universal answer that you're going to get and that this is much more true now than it was 20 years ago. It does not matter what you major in to get into medical school. I, I do medical school interviews here at Case. Um, I have colleagues that are, that are chairs of medical school admissions committees at various medical schools across the country. It does not matter what you major in. Do not choose your pre-medical major based on what you think that do not choose a major based on what you think will look good to an admissions committee. Choose your major based on what you're interested in because you will consequently do better at it and that will make your application stronger. And it really is a universal truth that it does not matter what you major in. All you have to do is get the appropriate prerequisites and there will probably be another video that's associated with this. Um, but that, that's a year of general chemistry, a year of organic chemistry, a year of calculus, a year of physics, and starting in 2015, I think it is, a semester of biochemistry and some places ask you for a semester of statistics. You get those done, you have a bachelor's degree, you do well on your entrance exams, and that's what you should focus on. Choosing a major that you're interested in. Right. That's, that's great information. They really want you to do well in whatever you decide it is, even if it's music, physics, chemistry, and that you've done well on that. So that's really good advice. I have another student who is interested in doing a BS degree and sees a lot more requirements in the BA and wants to know if they'll have time to complete a minor if they're, comp if they're completing a bachelor of science degree. It, it is more challenging. I'm not, I'm not going to say it's, it's easy. It is more challenging, especially in chemistry, that if you do a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry, that you have accounted for that almost 120-something hours. That it is more challenging, but it is absolutely entirely possible. And, you know, you're going to be predisposed to certain minors. Um, specifically, you're going to be predisposed to both math and physics minors because you're already taking so many of those courses. Um, it, it's a little bit more challenging to do things that are completely outside, but, but we absolutely have students that do minors. There's Last year, I think that there were a couple of foreign language minors um, that were among our Bachelor of Science students. And then we have one other question. It was follow-up to what Professor Butler talked about in his presentation about SIs and wants to know a little bit more about what that is and if the other departments or other classes have SIs. Um, SIs are what are called supplemental instructors. So we have undergraduate students, usually sophomores, junior, seniors, that sit in on the introductory courses and then in addition to doing that, they run either small group or large group review sessions for those classes. Um, they get paid um, well, $10 an hour and they work about 10 hours a week. So that's about standard. And 
um, they help out the students that, that struggle in those courses to, to provide. It, it, it provides them a, a nice opportunity to, to earn some money, and it helps the, the first year students um, do better in the class. I might add that uh, math actually runs its own SI program, but the university, uh, through educational uh, services for students, runs an SI program that covers uh, many other departments, physics, chemistry, uh, many other uh, departments that have large first-year courses. And they give these students special training. They learn how to teach. They learn how to interact with students themselves. Uh, and uh, those SI leaders do have to attend the lectures for the courses they're teaching. And then they run what would probably be considered recitation sections at other universities, um, perhaps run by graduate students at other institutions, but run by your fellow undergraduates here, the undergraduates who have gone through training to do just that, and who have done well in the course themselves. Great. This is, uh, will probably be our last question as we're running up on some time, and I think it's probably best answered by Professor Toktrup. We've got someone who's interested in going to pre-med, pre but is not sure if they want to do biology, chemistry, biochem. What, what kind of advice would you give them their first year to maybe help them decide, knowing that a lot of the classes they'll take in that first semester, whatever those majors are, are going to be the same? Yeah, so, so the coursework, I think, is um, not going to differentiate very much from chemistry, from, from that whole sort of biological spectrum. I mean, if you think about the chemistry biology spectrum, you can go anywhere from being a chemistry major to a chemical biology major to a biochemistry major to a biology major. I think that m what my specific advice would be once you get on campus is that all of the departments will have um, various flavors of what are called open houses. I would encourage people to come in and talk to the departments during those times. That's gonna be when people are thinking about looking at majors. But I think that what I would specifically do is look at the courses that are associated with each individual major and use Google as a tool to give you an idea of the types of things that are contained within those courses. Right, so I mean, if you if you just Google what biochemistry is and look at what a biochemistry course is, that will give you a pretty good sense of what the content of a major like that will be. But again, I think that my best piece of advice is to look carefully at the courses that are inherent in that major. Um, and if it's primarily, again, for, for pre-medical studies, the advice is again the same, is focus on something that you're fundamentally interested in. Identify a major where the courses interest you and the major gives you enough flexibility to do the other things that you wanna do while you're on campus. Um, if you're interested in, in potentially going on and, and being a professional in the field of chemistry, physics, or math, or any of the other fields, you know, talk to the professors in those fields specifically and see what they do. Um, so again, I, I would say that in just choosing between the various majors in the chemistry biology spectrum, just look at the course content carefully. That's what, that'd be my advice. Thank you, we got some really great advice from all of you guys today. And before we wrap up, I want to let you make any closing comments that you have um, for our incoming students. Uh, my only advice would be what I said previously, was that once you get on campus, make sure that you make connections with the faculty. I mean, if you're taking Math 121 or 122, I'm gonna be the one that's teaching that class. Come see me, come talk to me, I'm happy to meet with you, and I'd, I'd love to see you once you get here on campus. Anything on that? Uh, not really, I mean, it's kind of like a general piece of advice is to embrace the process. Um, you know, and that's advice that I would give to everybody across in, across their entire career. Don't don't think that anything you know that everything that you're going to be doing in your first year is is thought out carefully, and embrace the process. I mean, you can learn a lot about becoming a professional if you embrace the process. Okay, and I have two parting thoughts I'd like to add. Uh, one of them, I, I think you've heard this or sensed it uh, in other things, comments we've made, this is going to be the best time of your life to explore and discover your interests. I'd love if those interests were included physics, uh, but this is the time to try different things. 
case is a little bit unusual in that so many of our students come in with a very good idea of what they want to major in, but a lot of those students change their minds somewhere along the way. So feel free to explore and look into different disciplines, not just sciences, but you know, humanities, social sciences, etc. The last thing I want to say, is, because I know that you're going to be starting to register in a couple of weeks, pushing that button to get into your courses, and some of you will find that the physics courses appear to be closed. Uh, we are limited in the number of students we can handle in our labs, so we purposely, uh, min not minimize, but we put up a limited number of lab slots to begin so that we can reserve spots for students who absolutely need a lab course at a certain time. However, we have plenty of capacity to handle everyone who needs a physics course. In my 32 years here, no student has ever been denied admission into the physics course. So if you don't get it when you first push the button, don't worry. We'll be opening up more lab sections. You can send a permit request to an instructor and get in. We just have to organize the times and exactly when you'll get in. That's very welcoming, Professor Chotner. Mm -hmm. I'd like to thank all of our hosts this evening, Professor Butler, Professor Chotner, and Professor Toktra. I'd like to thank everyone for listening. Before we leave you tonight, I just want to remind you of two upcoming online information ses sessions, which will be in July. One will be on July 9th, which will be um, you know, taking your last-minute questions for registration. And I'm sure they'll have lots that will be going on right before then. And July 18th will be uh, What's Next? We'll talk about how we're reviewing your class schedules, tips for success when in your first year, and how to really work with your advisor and faculty members to really make the most of your experience here. So we thank everyone for being with us tonight, and have a good evening.